afternoon. Um, I'm Patrizia Marti from University of Siena in Italy. Uh, before starting my talk, I would like to say just a few words about uh, my university and my department. Uh, we started in 1992, and in Italy, uh, my department, it is communication science, was quite an experiment at that time because we decided to mix uh, people from communication, psychology, technology, design, and uh, so engineering, and we work all together, so still work all together. And um, I, I will show you uh, some of the results of our, um, of our work, of our projects. But for me, it's important to say that this multidisciplinarity is a value for us. So we really want to, to mix and to share and to exchange. And I'm available to do this for you today. So even after my talk, if you want, to, if you want any information, I'm, I'm very happy to, uh, to, to stay here with you. Uh, so the, the title of my talk is Beauty of Interaction. So I will try to say something about beauty, what is beauty for me. And uh, uh, before starting, I would like to say that this work is, uh, uh, is, is, uh, was started a few years ago in collaboration with other groups, in particular, uh, to explain what beauty is, uh, beauty and interaction is for me. Uh, I would like to start um, quoting uh, Kay Overbeke, uh, who was professor at the Technical University Eindhoven, and very sadly passed away a few months ago, but I'm very happy to share with you the work that I did with him. And um, this is also a way to continue uh, his dreams and his activity. Uh, so, Speaking about uh, beauty and interaction, um, Case was used to say that design is about people, it's about um, our way of living, our hopes, our dreams, our loneliness and joy, our sense of beauty and justice. Uh, it's about the social and the good. It's about being in the world. And uh, in this context, it's, uh, it's a very poetic approach uh, uh, to the design of interactive technologies. Um, we were, and we still are convinced that uh, meaning is in action, meaning is in interaction. It's not that we find something that we can find in the world, that's something that we can teach to, to our students. It's something that we construct together. So th this is uh, the main vision of this talk and the, the approach. And uh, uh, instead of explaining this in word, I would like to start with two videos. And, and these videos will be commented just afterwards. So. So this is a lamp, an interactive lamp, that was designed by a PhD student at the Technical University Eindhoven. And this is Philips Ross. And you see the lamp, you don't see any switch. And uh, the lamp just invites you to explore, to touch, to stroke. And sometimes the lamp doesn't know exactly what to do, so it has to be uh, in a sense, reassured about what to do, where to direct the, the light. And you will see in a while there are different ways of interacting with this lamp. mainly stroking, and the material of this lamp is extremely uh, pleasurable to, to stroke and to touch.
So it's a learning process. The lamp and the user are interactive to learn user preferences. So what is really needed at that time to have a good experience of reading? And now let me show another one, another lamp again. This is another student project. This is a master project. This is a different kind of lamp. Again, you interact with the lamp. There are no switches around. And you try to, uh, to adapt the way to use it. But then you see, sometimes the lamp doesn't want to collaborate at all. So maybe you have to try again and try to convince. No, there is no way. OK, so why? Why people should buy a lamp that, like this, a lamp that maybe doesn't do what is expected to do? And the reason for this, I thought that this was a good example uh, for this concept of beauty of interaction, uh, because these lamps are about opening their functionality to the action of the user. They are about exploring. They are about uh, trying things. So they are open to uh, our um, perceptual motor skills. But they are also about reading. And they are also about feeling good, about beauty, uh, reading a good book, maybe. So they are about emotional skills. Um, as I said, they are about reading. So the cognitive is there. And they are also about values. Values are personal, but values are social. So they are about social skills. And this is what beauty of interaction is about. It's a combination of this. And these lamps are physical hypotheses that show what is uh, the value behind design for beauty in interaction. And this is something that we try to teach to our students. And so I want to show you other uh, videos and other projects from the students. But before um, having a look at these videos, I would like to say that having the beauty in mind means that uh, the designers have to create a context for, for an experience, first of all. And so they don't uh, have just to design a good product. Um, they have to offer a context to to, to enjoy uh, whatever, a film, or to work, um, sharing, staying together. Uh, but uh, it is important to do this in a beautiful way. So uh, using all our skills in a very uh, natural way. And it is important that technology is embodied. So we use our body to interact uh, with the interactive technologies. And first of all, it's important that technology is experiential and respectful. Uh, let me uh, explain what I mean by respectful. And um, try to imagine this situation. Huh? Uh, you are in a shop, and the shop assistant uh, threw the biscuit at your feet, just doing this. And you bent down, and you began to pick up the crumbs. And uh, after some fiddling, you managed to get your change out of his fist. So could you ever accept uh, a behavior like this in a shop? Never, of course. Hmm? But this is exactly what we accept when uh, we use a vending machine. When you, we use a vending machine, uh, we insert coins, and sometimes we have to take the bottles 
doing something like that, put our hands in dirty holes, and okay, I have quite an example of really unacceptable vending machine that we, that we use every day. So starting from this example, uh, we asked to our students to design new vending machines having beauty in mind. And this is what they did. First of all, the, the vending machine tries to attract your attention. The, the, the machine, the, the cans, follow the movement of the person. And then, also, they were very much focused on the way in which the, the, the machine opened. Because this is something that is really uh, uh, bad sometimes with, uh, with some vending machines. And Again, everything, also the gestures, are extremely natural. I want that. I don't have to type numbers, for example, because typing is, of course, something that uh, can lead to errors. And again, you can waste your money and, and, and so on and so forth. But uh, the, the way in which the experience was reinterpreted by the, the students was, was quite interesting to see. And then there were, of course, other uh, examples um, of you couldn't call these vending machines, but uh, let me show what they, what they tried. They tried to have a kind of a expressive interaction with a machine that tries to give you something. And the first example is a machine that is a bit nervous and maybe scared about your touch. So mm, the machine doesn't know exactly what to do, but at the end, uh, it gives uh, the a small nuts. And the other one is very uh, poetic and beautiful. second one. not very convinced, so... So there is a way of having expressive technologies and uh, a very simple, natural way to uh, interact uh, with such technologies. And everything should be extremely embodied, so we don't need 
uh, necessarily uh, interfaces that we design just to interact with the technologies. We can use our body and we can use the environment as we uh, as it is possible to see uh, from this example. This was another project from uh, a master uh, student um, who designed this system to, uh, to listen music. Hello, I love you, let me jump in your get you so the same old broken man So this is the, the context of, of the, the work that I'm doing uh, at the University of Siena. And um, these are some of the examples from uh, the students' project. But uh, what I'm trying to do now is to try to challenge this approach in, um, in different domains. And uh, one of these, uh, an extremely challenging domain for applying the beauty of interaction, is the healthcare, so the rehabilitation um, and, uh, and care in general. So, uh, what is beauty in therapy and care? <laughs> uh, is, uh, to me, this is really the experience of use that uh, lead to a feeling of engagement, and also to the hope of the recovery. We all know that um, when doing uh, rehabilitation, for example, physical rehabilitation, is extremely boring. You have your problem and you have to repeat again and again the same movement. And people don't want to do this. And in particular, children don't want to do this. They get bored and that's it. And so, why don't we try to make also rehabilitation um, a beautiful experience, an engaging experience? Uh, the other point is that um, rehabilitation tool, uh, tools manifest disability. They are awful, awful to wear, awful to touch, and they immediately manifest uh, disability. So is there anything that we can do uh, to avoid this? Is there anything to make them uh, playful, engaging, surprising, nice to use, beautiful to use? And uh, the, the other point to me that is very important is that um, rehabilitation usually focuses on uh, impaired perceptual motor skills. And so what I'm trying to do is to recombine the other skills that are still intact in people with a, who have, um, uh, for example, physical or cognitive problems, and then to use them in combination without focusing on the disability itself. So this is, this is the, the context. And um, when I try this work, few, uh, oh, sorry. Uh, it is not easy to, to read the, the, the first question, but the question was, it is possible to design with, uh, uh, to have an aesthetically minded design uh, to, um, to uh, develop uh, rehabilitation tools. And um, yeah, the, the, there are some attempts uh, these are uh, nice examples that I saw, that I found um, uh, on internet. 
And the first one, uh, these are crutches that are made by ceramic. They are very nice to wear and to touch. Uh, they are very elegant. And these are other examples of uh, this kind of tools that are like a bit fashion. Uh, but to me, what is important here is that the beauty is not only in appearance. Uh, the beauty is in interaction. So how can we design rehabilitation tools that are pleasurable to use? Um, I started a few years ago, as I said, with this, uh, with this topic uh, that I explored in different projects. In particular, I used, uh, and, I, and I'm still using, uh, robots for, um, for autistic children, for example, for um, elderly people and other kind of interactive tools. I will show you uh, some examples of this. And um, th this is uh, the first example. Um, I worked for a um, few, I, I would say, a couple of years in uh, home cares with elderly people, and in particular for people um, affected by dementia. And the problem they have in particular is isolation, is the isolation. They don't communicate very much, uh, they see it. Uh, most of the day, waiting for lunch and dinner, mainly, and that's it. And it's extremely difficult for them to get in contact with other people, to communicate with other people, because uh, the language is impaired. And um, so, since they, in some way, realize this, they refuse to communicate with other people. Uh, so, um, I, I had a team at that time that was, um, uh, it was an international team of designers, and, and, we, and we started this project and we developed what we call the rolling pins. They are um, cylinders and plastic tubes, mainly, that can communicate uh, with each other. And, uh, they can uh, uh, produce different kind of feedbacks, uh, sounds, lights, and vibrations. And uh, what is interesting is that the system, that these rolling pins are used um, in two or three people at least. So when you shake or you roll one of your rolling pin, that is a, a cylinder like this, uh, the output of your action is reflected on the other pins. And whenever the two persons um, make this exactly the same kind of movement, uh, the, the pins vibrate. So this means that you can perceive the perception of the other person. And when you tune each other, when the person tune each other, uh, you can feel that you are doing exactly the same. And for the therapist, this is uh, quite important when you are able to, to, to tune with another person, because this means that you are able to read the mind of an, another person. And this is something that people with dementia uh, cannot do. Um, so this is, uh, let me show you the, the system, how it works. Oops. Okay, so I, I tried this system with, um, with elderly people in this home care, and uh, we did an experiment. Uh, we divided the uh, people in two groups, and one group wor uh, worked or tried the system in a condition where the two rolling pins didn't communicate each other, and the other group 
uh, worked with the, with the system uh, in the condition where the, the rolling pin communicated each other. So this means that the person could feel the perception of the other one, so making the same kind of movement. And uh, you can see the result of the... On the right, you have the therapist. And this is the first condition, when the rolling pin don't communicate each other. You see the person doesn't do anything. She refused to put the hands on the, on the rolling pin. <coughs> But wow. this is the condition in which the rolling pin communicates. these videos with the, the therapists and the doctors. And uh, w what is interesting to see is that they, uh, they interpreted the, the different movements, the choreographies of movement, in a very specific way. They said that this is a kind of non-verbal uh, dialogue uh, where you express a kind of relaxation uh, when you do something like that, so it's a very uh, um, easy uh, movement, or anxiety or, and effort when they did the, the rotations. So it was a way to communicate with the therapist about their inten internal state. And uh, again, you can see here a combination of sensory motor skills and perceptual skills and visual and, um, and cognitive skills and social skills. So it's really a way to get in touch and to uh, try to uh, also to involve in the activity uh, skills that usually are not very much practiced by, by, by these persons. So this this uh, system was uh, really successful. It is still in use in this home care in the, in the north of Italy. Uh, this is another example. It's another system for children with uh, cognitive and physical um, disabilities. And the system is called Active Surfaces. And uh, the, the idea here and the beauty here was to work in the water because the water is, uh, is really a fantastic context for, uh, for the rehabilitation. In water, even, if, even people with physical disabilities can move autonomously. So children with physical disabilities can play with other children. They don't need any other support. They can move. Hmm? And also, children with cognitive disabilities uh, can, be, um, can play in this kind of environment because the water is extremely relaxing. So it helps to maintain the focus of attention uh, during the activity. And so before this, before this system was uh, developed and tried out in a real context, I asked my student to think about, um, to develop concept of this kind of systems, um, having this idea of the beauty of interaction in mind. And you can see what they did and the very sophisticated techniques that we use for prototyping ideas.
Third, this is more or less the way in which we prototype ideas and we work with the doctors and the therapists. It's extremely easy to develop concept and to show uh, to the people. So just to be sure that what you are going to develop is exactly what people need, as something that they can use and they want to experiment. And so also this system was developed in, in, a, in a final system and uh, it was developed in the uh, form of floating files instead of working uh, in, on the, the floor of the, the swimming pool. And um, again, uh, there are modules, there are tiles that communicate each other and you can do different kinds of games. And like the Scrabble games or sequence games or matching colors and these kind of things. When you put the, the tiles in the, in the right sequence, uh, the, the configuration at the end uh, lights up. Um, so again, this, this is uh, an example of combination of physical and cognitive skills and also uh, children really love to, to play these kind of games, and it is a way to continue the therapy. Uh, again, this, was, this is still in use um, uh, in Siena, in a swimming pool in Siena. Uh, the second context in which I'm trying to, to challenge the idea of beauty of interaction is education. And of course, this is extremely important for, uh, for us because uh, if you don't train uh, people uh, in designing with this idea, uh, you don't have, I mean, uh, prototypes and system to, to try out. And there is no way to have a societal impact if you don't develop system like that. So to, to see if this idea of beauty of interaction can really have an impact on the, the society. And um, this is an example of uh, a project that we did last year. A it was a module, it was a design school, an international design school that was called Life Through Culture. And uh, in this, uh, the, the, the idea was to, to wave technologies, light technologies, um, and to uh, introduce them in a very, uh, in a rich cultural context. Um, with the idea to learn together how to use light technologies to express meanings about history. And we didn't do the module at the university, but we did the module in a museum in Siena. And that is a special place because it was um, an hospital and then uh, and now it is a, a museum. Uh, it's a very big, um, it's a very big building, and we gave them a very uh, difficult uh, design brief. So we actually asked them to to design an experiential route, um, uh, trying to explore the fact that this museum is built on the Via Francigena. Via Francigena is, the, is a um, uh, pilgrimate uh, route um, that was uh, used by pilgrims from France and UK to go to Rome. And, uh, this, um, and Siena was one of the, 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 the places where the pilgrims stopped and to, to rest a bit and then to continue their, um, their path uh, toward Rome. And so the questions that, that, that we uh, asked the student to respond were, are the tourists the new pilgrims? Uh, what they look for when they start a pilgrimage like this? Uh, do they look for hope, for silence, for enlightenment? So again, it's, uh, it was a very poetic way of thinking about the history of this place. So as I said, we asked them to design this experiential route, and um, we tried to address their craftsmanship and their different culture and cultural and educational background. Uh, we, we had uh, six, children, uh, six students from, uh, from Eindhoven and six students from Siena with different background, and they took the full responsibility uh, to design this path. And the school was organized in three phases mainly. 
The first phase was about uh, opening sensitivities. So we asked them to go around and to be inspired about the space. So about the smell, the gloom, the darkness. S just really stay there. The, the, the module uh, lasted two, two weeks. And in two weeks, they had to design and develop the installation. And then we opened the exhibition to the, to the public. And then uh, they studied about, we, we had part of the module was uh, dedicated to the history of the place. And then the students split in groups and they started making, just playing with technologies, light technologies, and try to see how to use Arduino boards and sensors and actuators uh, to, uh, to build different installations. And the third phase was about the reflection. So opening the exhibition to the public and try to uh, involve visitors in discussions about what they visited, what they understood, which kind of experience they had uh, from visiting the museum. And they, uh, they did actually quite a good work. This, this is the, the, the path in the museum. So there were five different installations in the space. And I want to show the, the first one, that is this one, point zero. And this is the introduction to the space. Who are in this day and age the new pilgrims? Are they the theorists? What are the insights and what are the discoveries that could be made along the way? Enlightenment? Hope? Silence? Our story takes you on a personal pilgrimage through life. We came from the north on our way to Rome and finally reached Siena. On the way, we got to know other pilgrims, and we are now sharing the difficulties of our journey through four spaces. So this is the first space that is um, a quite interesting space. This was um, the morgue of the old hospital. And um, uh, when people died, they stayed there for 24 hours uh, before dispensing the, the blessing. And since there were no scientific uh, instruments to establish the death with certainty, um, the, um, the, the doctors were used to, to put a uh, bell uh, at the ankles of, attached to the ankle of the corpses. So if in 24 hours they didn't see any sound, people were dead. And, uh, and this was the way in which they, they treated the uh, People. And uh, this is the interpretation of the students of this, of this space that was called the room of uncertain death. It is called like that. the space is fully interactive. And also the next one that is called uh, uh, the washing facility of the wet nurses. This is a washing facility that dates back to the uh, medieval age. And the water um, uh, were collected in, uh, uh, in these basins, this washing facility, and were used by the wet nurses to, uh, to wash the, the, the clothes of the orphans that were hosted in, uh, in this place. 
And uh, the students uh, interpreted this space in, in this way. So this is one of the corridors. They simulate the water um, leaking from the walls uh, with the light. Everything is simulated with the light. And this is, uh, they simulated the, the water inside the washing facility with a smoke machine. And everything is interactive. So the idea is that if you pretend to, to wash clothes, then when the clothes are clean, the, the water changes the, the color. So they reproduce also the, the, the sound of the, of the space. Of the of the retina. So, if you are interested in uh, having a look at the video of the whole exhibition, the video is accessible there. And I want to to finish my uh, presentation going back to the to the vision of this work and. Uh, as I said, this was basically the, the idea of working with the beauty of interaction uh, came from exploring and um, uh, trying to develop a theoretical framework. And then now, after a few years, is something that we are really using and challenging in specific application domains. And uh, the, the, the ambition is to create in our labs, in our universities, uh, an innovation space where creativity uh, can meld with research and development. And uh, also as a way to uh, develop uh, new methodologies to teach and to learn and to design uh, to understand human, human activity in the world. So this is the, really the vision. And there are some central themes. I'm sorry you cannot read this, but uh, first of all, the focus of our work is the human activity. Uh, you don't, we don't work in the lab, we work in the real context of use. Sometimes the contexts are also uh, quite challenging, working in the hospitals, in the schools, with people with different problems also in their life. Uh, everything is, uh, all the technologies are uh, really embodied. The interaction is embodied. The interaction is extremely uh, natural without any kind of um, uh, interface rather than the body and the environment. Uh, engagement is a key word. So we want to engage people. We want to uh, create space for opportunities and for experiences for them. And um, uh, interaction is, uh, is the, the key point. Um, so we see interaction as a narrative activity where people can put their meaning inside. And interaction is multimodal in the sense that it has to incorporate uh, several sensory uh, modalities. And uh, technology here is uh, interpreted as augmentation. So we don't want to uh, view technology as um, a way to uh, model us and to understand our, uh, our needs, but we want to develop these needs and the support in interaction, during the interaction. Um, so the very closing uh, slide of my, uh, of my talk uh, is this one. Um, I, I really like this piece from Masaito uh, and Murray, and I would like to read this uh, with you to close my speech. 
And this says that an individual's overall capacity to judge things changes completely depending on whether he possesses a sense of pathos of things, sensitivity to beauty, and compassionate empathy. These things change one's whole caliber as human beings. And this is the reason why we believe that design can really help in trying to compose this view and this framework. And um, I hope that I we, we can also try with, uh, with our students to, uh, to, to bring this, uh, this idea of the beauty of interaction in their uh, uh, design, if for uh, developing their design skills. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you.